I don't like this guy at 5, or really anything past the second game. It feels like they were too eager to justify the sequels and kept slapping more and more on top until it became kind of intimidating, even for a veteran. Also, they forgot how to write a story probably around the third or fourth game. However, Disgaea 5 is the only one that features usable damaging items, so this is what we're playing. Who knows, maybe I'll enjoy it more on the other side. As always, the rules are simple. I can't use anything but items to achieve glorious completion. For this game specifically, there may be a few minor exceptions, but we'll, we'll talk about those when we get there. We open with an anime flotation device and her battalion of prinnies getting nuked by an opposing force. Led by a fella called Void X Dark 666, they've taken many netherworlds and are super encroaching the rest of the universe. A mysterious goth kid who isn't cringe shows up, smashes some ramen, and wipes the opposing army off the face of the earth. This is some office worker's self insert, and honestly, it's mine too. Floaty McGee falls in love with the brooding edgelord before ruining his supple kakoyi flesh with a few rounds of convincing. <laughs> I'm to believe this is how the Japanese make friends, which explains why their population's in rapid decline. After a bit more anime meandering, we hit the hub and it's time to explore to see what we're working with. Not that there's much to explore. Before we mosey over to the item shop, there is a special content NPC who grants premium boons for the paying customer. This is where you inherit all the DLC, which includes powerful characters, a slew of starter items, as well as a small loan of 1 million hell, this game's currency. I'm obviously not going to use this stuff, but I at least wanted to address it. It's just not in the spirit of a challenge run to start with a million bucks. We need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. The item store stocks throwing knives, which are the only damaging item available for now, but they should be fine. The description reads, Not too powerful, but useful as a diversion. Yeah, we'll see about that. I can afford 60, but I only buy 40, as I notice they have 100 points in the hit stat, which is used by guns and bows to determine damage. Effectively, this means the higher my hit stat is, the higher these items should hit. The protagonist starts with a fist weapon, which uses attack and speed for damage calculation, so we've already got work to do. I scrounge up my remaining pittance and head to the weapon store, dumping everything from my inventory that isn't a throwing knife and peeping the accessories. They offer glasses, which increase hit by seven a piece. That's like three and a half per lens, and characters can equip up to three accessories. I also buy the most expensive gun, which gives me four more hit. As the protagonist only has a base of 30, and we've just acquired 25 more through equipment, we've already doubled our damage output before engaging a single encounter. Let's go see if items are actually viable. The first stage is up. We've got a couple of thugs trying to introduce a life tax, and they quickly find out how I feel about taxation. A knife is thrown. It's got a range of four squares, which is already three better than a regular fist attack. Keeps me out of the counter range, lowers the foe's speed, and it does a cracking 30 damage, which is a one-shot to the current enemies. Very nice. I did want to put my equipment on and test what kind of boost we'll get, but this dumb bastard keeps countering enemies, which is problematic. I'm going to have to rethink my approach to combat, but first we load up the equipment and do a damage test. Both the knives crit, and they hit around 80, which is primo, as foes have 30 or so health. Okay, so after a quick restart, because I failed the run by letting my goth husband counter, I perform the same setup steps and head back to the first stage. The first knife is off, and it does 50 damage. I'm pretty chuffed with that. After the knife is cast, to prevent any more counter damage, I send out floaties to lift her Twinkie Savior, preventing enemies from entering his personal space. Thrown to the side, he pops the left guy and we're still out of the hot zone of the monks. The middle monk goes down in the following round as Serafina rushes the one to the right, but as her hit stats low, she fails to dispatch him. I send out two more characters, dealing six damage each, ending the final monk. We've done it, boys. We beat the first stage. Only 80 or so to go, but we're off to a swimming start. As a part of the story, we're forced to make a new character, which is where the run truly begins. Despite starting with a maid, I use my free recruit to enslave a second, because that gives her like, eight more hit. Naming her Itima, I load her up with three pairs of glasses and a fancy gun. I look into buying a gun for her secondary equipment slot, but it only gives a tiny stat increase, and I get nothing from it at this point. Now each class comes with a unique ability called an evility, because the characters are... Evil. Anyway, I choose the maid, as hers is efficient work, which allows me to use an item after I've already finished my primary battle command. Since my primary battle command will be an item, that means I can use two items per turn. Another boon is that her counter value is a big fat zero. Zilch, I never have to play funny lifting games in fear of counter-attacking enemies ever again. Next up is stage 1-2, wherein we match up against the lifting overlord and have to play funny lifting games. This is a standard stage where enemies die in a single turn, though it's encouraged to use the barrels to build yourself a staircase leading to the backside of the map. This brings up the question of lifting. Uh, do you even? Lifting is a command that's not really designed to deal damage, though it certainly can. Plenty of stages require lifting to pass, such as the one I'm currently on, and despite some stages having alternate methods of approach, I don't think I can beat the game without the lift command. Given that I'm not dealing damage or getting any kind of combat advantage outside of access to my foes, I don't think it's an issue, so I'm gonna let it ride. 
The stage is cleared with flying colours, and its completion unlocks the quest giver NPC, who dishes out little tasks that reward us with... all sorts of crap. Most of the early game quests give cash money, which is fantastic, because I never know when I'm going to hit a cash wall. Or a poverty wall, I, I guess. A cash wall would be fantastic. The following two stages aren't even worth going over, as I one-shot everything, but then I hit the final stage of the chapter, wherein a big fire overlord one-shots me. Here I was, thinking I could get away with no armor. And I can, I just need to be sneaky about it. My options are pretty limited here, I don't have a lot of cash, but I do have 100 throwing knives, so the damage output's there, I just need to be the best woman I can be. You know, able to take a punch. I could create a second maid, but I'm feeling the single character vibe at the moment, it's less complicated and costs less money, so I've decided to use a little strategizing, which is uh, rare for Disgaea. The plan is as follows, I'm going to run around engaging enemies at a safe distance and dispatching any troublemakers while leaving enough to pop the fiery overlord for me, then I'll swoop in and finish him off. The execution goes a little too well and he wipes the entire enemy army by himself, which counts as a win. Ah oh well, on to chapter 2. I start by clearing more quests to stack some green, then head for the first stage of chapter 2, which is where another exception to the items only rule may rear its colourful pyramid head. For those who don't know, Disgaea features many, many systems. Most are simple, but they all interact on these dynamic axioms, which can change the face of combat very quickly. While it is a fairly standard grid-based tactics RPG where stat values are king, one of the systems that subverts that is Geo Effects. As maps are square-based, they featured coloured planes overlaid on the core grid, a secondary floor in a way. These colour-coded surfaces, called Geo Panels, oftentimes contain effects from a small pyramid unit called a Geo Symbol. If a Geo Symbol rests atop a particular colour, then every square that shares that colour receives whatever effect it produces. This can include buffs, debuffs, status ailments, disabling features such as ranged attacks, granting immortality, and all sorts of other... fun things. Once a Geo symbol is destroyed, it will change the Geo panels to its own colour, damaging anyone standing on them, and can be chained if you load a bunch of symbols in a Rube Goldberg-esque pattern, effectively clearing the map and doing big damage. The first stage of Chapter 2 is a tutorial for this system, and it would be a non-issue if it wasn't for the damage it dealt. My instinct is to make a Geo Panel Chain, which increases my bonus gauge, and that gives me more items and money after combat, but then I realise that by doing this, I will have caused damage without items. The chaos of a Disgaea map could see foes pop these symbols as well, so it brings up the question of, is this allowed, and in what capacity? If an enemy breaks a panel, or if I have to pop one to make progress, am I breaking the rules? If a panel supercharges a foe and they take damage from me removing that effect, is that on me or is that an unavoidable byproduct of the game? I'm going to say that the best course forward for now is to avoid intentionally damaging enemies, and I'll note any exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. Naturally, if I delve into the item world, which cranks the chaos up to at least a 7, all bets are off, but we're, uh, we're not there yet. The next stage is up, and it features a new enemy type, Sludge, and these little goo fellas come with a troublesome evility, Gel Body. This decreases all non-elemental damage by 50%, and as our knives aren't on fire, we now do half damage. To compensate for this, I finally acquire the mana to unlock my own ability, know how to use it, increasing my healing from items by 100% and damage from items by 50%. This doesn't wholly mend the damage loss, but we're outputting at 75% damage instead of 50%. Even with this, the slimes aren't a huge issue, we keep a respectable distance and slowly whittle them down. Chapter 2, Stage 3, and we get absolutely rolled. There's a horde of hard-hitting enemies and a few sludges sprinkled in, and my poor little zombie girl can't take it. I head out of the stage and create a second QT maid girl. Oh yeah, bros. I'm assembling a harem. I throw myself at 2-3 again, and it goes significantly better now that I've got a bait character. The hard-hitting thieves at the head of the snake focus on the fresh flesh, which gives Itima a clear range to blast them away. Entering the fourth stage, I'm at odds with some geo panels, whose effects I can't out-damage. They give the enemies plus 50% defense, 20% recovery, which heals a fifth of their health every turn, and some other shit, so to prevent myself getting rolled, I blow them up, dealing light damage. By the time I got to those damaged, a healer had patched them up anyway, so I'm gonna say this is fine and talk about the core gimmick of this stage. Creating a pillar high enough to kill the mage in the center. The idea is to stack skulls, creating stairs to access the little guy, or having a character with attack range high enough to cover the vertical distance. Unfortunately, despite items being superior to standard attacks thus far, their verticality is a huge letdown and will no doubt be a major limiting factor going forward, so I'm, uh, I'm building a rattly staircase. As I don't use the throw command to damage anyone, I'm also fine with this. The definition of an items only run becomes pretty vague when there's so many mechanics, but as long as 100% of my intentional damage comes from items, we're golden. And you know, if you disagree, do your own fucking item run. And send me a link, because you'd probably do it better than I did. Now, we're on to the final stage of Chapter 2, which starts with a VTuber necromancer screeching. Phew. Too soon, fandeads. 
Too soon. <laughs> Nigga. Entering the field, we're confronted with six zombies lining a short hall and two more in the back alongside a slightly beefier boss demon sitting on a level 10 panel. This is a geo panel that increases the level of all enemies atop it by 10% rounded up at the end of every turn. Zombies are pretty beefy already, I've got to clear them as quickly as possible so this guy doesn't get too powerful. I dive headfirst to the center of the crowd and am immediately surrounded, but unable to kill anything in two turns, which means I'm going to be here for at least eight. That's uh, that's eight extra levels for boss man Jack. I hold on just long enough until there's only a single corridor cadaver remaining, but ultimately succumb, and not to damage but to poison, which does 20% of your health per turn. Alright, here's the plan. I'm gonna grind mana in the old stages until I can afford Poison Vaccine, an ability that prevents the poison status ailment, as well as the item buff ability for my second wife. If there's one game in this items only series that I'm not gonna be precious about grinding in, it's gonna be Disgaea. I grab some additional healing and my item store hits level 2, granting me a small discount. Money hasn't been an issue so far, but it's nice to feel appreciated. Back at the cemetery, my girls take out two zombies in a single turn as I position them next to this post to prevent a complete surrounding on all sides. The second turn isn't as fruitful, with two zombies barely hanging onto their slither of health, but they have their turn, get the violence out of their system, and we're still looking good. More zombies go down, we're slowly milling through them, I heal up and push the boss after only a few turns. By this point, he's reached level 12 and has 900 health. I hit 100 or so with a good damage roll, so it's not impossible, but it is a little bit sketchy. With Kilia to heal and my girls whittling him down to half health, we take one more turn and he falls. With this victory, we have access to the strategy assembly where I can pass bills that offer various effects. One of the most important will be better items at the store, which unlocks the next tier of items, weapons, and accessories. The dawning of a new chapter potentially comes with an entire character upgrade, as well as more versatile ways to engage foes. The future's bright for this netherworld. I get my first item store upgrade, adding a damaging item which heals. Could that be any more useless, you know, given that healing items exist? I strip the new story character we got from the last map, sell all his shit, and then head to the equipment store where I can now purchase better glasses and guns. I've got 11,000 hell and I need around 80 to give my guys all the best hit boosting equipment. I grab the best tier of gun for one of my maids, adding a decent 40 or so hit, then we try to enter the first stage of a new chapter before being stopped by exposition delivered through anime cutouts. I try to lightly include story elements in these runs, so we've got a rough through line, and it's not just me saying, and then I used an item, and won. But as far as I'm concerned, Disgaea 5 has no story, and it'll get progressively more difficult for me to talk shit on. Anyway, on to Poison Dice, which despite the name, is not dicey at all. The first stage is nothing, but just to ensure my winning streak, I return to the hub and grab some armor for my zombie girls. Removing the poison resistance ability, I swap it for Agile Guy, which increases hit growth by 10%. In hindsight, you might think it's silly to remove poison immunity while I'm balls deep in a poison level. Then I grab two pairs of nerd glasses, increasing my hit a further 30, sitting both my girly girls around 200 each. The second stage, it's nothing. I throw my guys over the poison floor, and with enemies only having 2 to 400 health, and my items doing anywhere from the mid hundreds to 400 with crits, we don't stay for tea. Because it's poisoned. From here on, I'll be referring to stages by their chapter and stage numbers, so if I say 5 3, I'm not insulting your height, it's just short. 3-3 three, three is the same as the former, but completing it clears some quests, so I grab two more pairs of nerd glasses for the twins. I'm practically exploding with the force I'm emitting at this point, so I move on to smoke the next stage and get absolutely railed. I'm sorry, is, is this not Disgaea? When has walking forward ever not worked? Anyway, I take it a little slower this time and come packing many healing items, gradually making my way across the bridge, laying waste to all my foes, and narrowly avoiding the enemy boost panels which were my undoing last time. To my surprise, going slow works, uh, contrary to what the internet taught me about mindlessly jackhammering. Oh god, that explains so much. Then some absolute fuckbrick has walled off the dimension gates, and now I have to run 10 stages in the item world to make story progress. However, this actually ends up being a good thing. With every enemy dying to a single hit, and each stage yielding me a respectable 500 hell, I come out of the item world with deeper pockets, and, you know, also access to the item world, which is cool too. You know, if you want to break the game or whatever. Anyway, the next stage is a bit of a free-for-all, with two factions warring it out and us caught in the middle. My attempt to take a relaxed approach and let them sort it out between themselves failed, and I'm rushed and surrounded by foes. Some succumb to the pain of my items, others choose to stand and fight, which uh, sucks, because my girls are designed to deal pain, not uh, not receive it. Somehow, we survive the onslaught, and my maids go apeshit and raise this poisonous village to the ground. You know, even more so. On to chapter 4! We get better items again and take a little peeky gander at what our arsenal will consist of. Rotten garbage has been added to our selection. 
A damage test reveals that it has a fair chance of poisoning the foe, but only outputs about a third of the numeric power, and has a range of two squares. Poison is deadly, chunking 20% of a character's maximum life per turn, but given that I can one-shot most things, I'll stick with the current setup. In my ever-running quest for more defense I don't need but sorely want, I plunge into the item world. I'm weak to its beckoning wails, victim to its cries. We two souls have shed a cheese sandwich more than twice. Anyway, I come at 10 levels higher and 150,000 hell richer, which bankrolls my inevitable stat surge. Probably just broke the game. I get enough mana to reincarnate my maids to their fourth class tier, which gives them higher base stats, and we're doing around 1,000 damage with items. The snow's starting to ball. Let's make the hill steeper. I recruit a third maid, just in case, outfitted with all the goods, then set off for more story progress. 4-1 and 4-2 are nothing. My newfound defenses are keeping me alive, got a big hard belly now, and my damage is still through the roof because of that reincarnation. The narrative genius for this chapter is that a penguin has curry, and is running from hungry demons. Riveting. Popping into the third stage of the chapter, I'm confronted by a decent sized map full of clone panels. If you end a turn while standing on a clone panel, it would duplicate the character as is and make it a foe. I'm talking stats, equipment, levels, everything, and I'm not too worried as I don't exactly have good weapons or, you know, any skills, but my time in Disgaea has taught me to never fuck with clones. So I make a tower, throw my maid within range, and tear down the nodule, making this level another gradual samey encounter. Back in the hub, I check the quest tab and discover two that I can immediately complete, which pay out new attack items. The first is a javelin, which has 150 base power, 50% more than our throwing knives, though it's weighted to attack. The next is metal, which has 110 base power and scales to hit. This seems like a flat 10% damage increase with a one range penalty, but unfortunately, I can't purchase it. Back to the story, we cream through 4-4 and end up on the final map of the fourth chapter, where someone touches this rabbit's ears and she just loses it. I was told if they didn't have a helmet, you could interact with them like real people. She Naruto hops around, tanking enemies, but it's not long before we come under fire ourselves, and upon returning, we kill her and collect an ending. Well, that's Disgaea 5 completed with items only. Yes, it can be done. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time right here on the backlogs. Luckily, new Disgaea doesn't force cycle you to New Game Plus and puts me back in the hub before I made the heinous mistake of, uh, defending myself. I have another crack and play a little more reserved this time, calling in the state to take care of her, as I don't think she's fit for society. She takes down the social workers with a little help from Itima, thus ending the chapter. Getting my once per chapter store upgrade sees me gain nothing. No new attack items. I don't exactly need them, but it sure would be exciting to see. As item store upgrades also increase the tier of gear I can peruse, I make a cheeky little item world trip because things are getting pricey. While I mindlessly blew through airborne knives in this never-ending dungeon, I took a moment to do some research on subclasses, which allow characters to progress through other classes and access their abilities without leaving their primary class. This is a strange addition, but a welcome one, as I'm about to become yoked. I set one of my maids to sub as a fighter, and the other as a monk, which kicks off my quest to unlocking the pirate class, who feature an ability which increases hit growth by 30%. I'm still one-shotting dudes, but there's gonna come a time where I'm not, and I wanna be prepared. SPEED ROUND! 5-1 is steamed through like a Chinese animal, 5-2 features a zombie ambush, but other than enemies having deep health pools that slow my one-shotting streak, there's nothing of note here. Heading into 5-3, first we make a quick trick brick stack, then we clear some generics, again very little of note. It's not until the final stage of this chapter where something interesting happens, wherein we fight two plot significant zombies. These bosses have health pools that rest around 3,000, but we one-shot them. I was lying when I said something interesting happens. I don't know why you guys trust me, it's fucking weird. Chapter 6, we unlock the character world, which is like the item world, but for your character. This can be used to increase ability slots and aptitude, which is a percentage rating for how high your stats increase from equipment. I will definitely use this, but not now, it's too soon. New chapter, new store. We check for a fresh attack item and voila, medals are now purchasable, which will be an extra 10% damage at the cost of a more intimate skirmish. I dump my 400 odd throwing knives and stack around 200 medals, then we upgrade our armor and our cash pool runs dry. I'm never gonna get those new glasses. My vision may be blurred, but I can see the item world so clearly. Through the first few stages of chapter 6, I can tell you we're in Japan, but I can't tell you why. We're just waiting for the other bomb to drop. The final chapter features a man we've been introduced to and embarrassed by before, this chunky black armor guy, and he's rocking 15,000 health, a severe escalation from the previous record. Luckily for the progress of the run, but not so much the enjoyment, he's pathetically weak, and despite his thick plate, takes significantly more damage than the average enemy in this stage. The chapter closes, we go for our seventh store upgrade, and no items. As we've recently acquired medals, I'm not too fussed, but I crave excitement, and this run's not giving it to me in any capacity. I can barely even poke fun at the game, because nothing is happening. The next story beat is that a punchy guy who isn't as cool or brooding a punchy guy as the main character can't get it up, and I don't know if I should be sympathetic or embarrassed. 
It doesn't help that the story shuddered between four or five stages, so any major revelation or happening has to be subdivided into tiny baby chunks, then mixed with horrible anime dialogue, padding it out until our brains become mushy enough to enjoy this guy's endgame grind. I gotta say, it does work though. Next up is Sankano, which has a sick name. If I were to ever die tragically in a horrific way, I'd want it to have a cool name, like Sankano. The characters lament about dumb shit, and the first two stages pose no threat, but the third is where things get real spicy. It is a long map filled with enemy boost 50% panels and recovery 20, which gives every foe a flat 50% stat boost and recovers 20% of their health per turn. I think I've already explained that. With an enemy spawn panel in the rear which rapid fires moths at you, a class prone to dishing out ailments such as poison and paralysis, and a handful of ranged specialists being buffed by a healer, this one's a toughie. Even with the hard oppression, that you know by modern western standards, I come out on top with one of my three item maids, the other two having succumbed to buff hot hard cowboys. A few more stages like that, and this challenge run might be challenging. In the final map of the chapter, there's talk of using a secret combo technique to defeat the boss of the former chapter, and I was a bit worried I'd have to actually perform it in battle. Luckily for us, Disgaea is a budget game, and we're given everything in a cutscene. Also, the guy fucks it up completely. The fight itself is easier, as this guy has similar stats to his former encounter, and we're marginally stronger. We're speeding through the chapters now, boys, because there's literally nothing to commentate, but that means we get to open another item store chest. Da 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 da! Ah, oh, sick! We got a new item! Yay! Unfortunately, this scales to intelligence, but it is a fire elemental item, so it may come in handy eventually. Ah, oh, probably not. We're, we're never using any of this shit. The first couple of stages are, again, not too interesting, which is a shame, as the stage has an effect where if you're pushed off, you remain outside of combat. Very Phantom Brave. The next stage is noteworthy. Because of the damage variance on attacks in this game, I can't definitively kill the foes in a single shot, and they're all sitting on clone panels while having their intelligence extremely buffed in the back. I need to beat them down as quickly as possible as I run along these narrow chains in an attempt to push back the cloning or to drop the geo panel. Between the charm status effect, which seemed to pop off pretty frequently, and the constant clones clogging the corridors, I almost had a rough time with it, but luckily, chocolate cures all wounds. It almost fully heals me, and though enemies are now doing noticeable damage, it's still not quite enough to drop me before I can chow on some cacao. At the end of one of the most annoying stages, with single tile warp panels, the Befisted Kid earns a usable combat ability. This may be the end, boys. They're gonna make me use an ability in combat, I can... I can feel it. We only have five attack items left, so I head to the store to buy a hundred throwing knives and a hundred medals. That should do us for a couple more chapters. I also buy some night vision goggles to replace the plastic nose glasses I have, giving each of my girls an extra 250 hit for a total of around 1700 on each. The next level is just the same black armor guy again, but with 30,000 health this time. Luckily, we don't have to use any actual skills in combat, thank god, so I just blast him down with items, 3000 damage at a time. Then your boy Virgil shows up, some cutscene sparring occurs, and we're thrust into the next chapter, halfway through the fight for some reason. God, they're really stretching for content at this point. Hey, I feel ya. Anyway, new chapter means new items, and no it doesn't, there's, there's nothing again. 9-1 through 9-4 are uneventful, which is crazy considering the big evil guy showed up and ostensibly just buggered off. What's his deal? Enemies are starting to ramp up their damage, and our range is keeping us comfy, but ultimately it's the same old. Until it's not. In a tussle over a legendary spear, I come up against a map full of strong units and a generic with a boss sign over his head. I assumed I could face fuck everything again, as that's more or less worked for the past 20 minutes, but my girls got wiped so hard, the buttholes will never be dirty again. Now we kinda hit a crossroads. I could take this to heart and play it like a game of chess, where I expertly position my units in prime spaces to take the most enemies while receiving the least damage. Or, I could power grind and stat roll them. I power through the item world of a Dark Rosary, an accessory which increases every stat, gaining immense levels in cash, allowing me to kit my characters out with better gear. In addition, I unlock level 2 of the pirate subclass, granting me the ability Demonic Marksman, which increases my hit aptitude by 30%. Aptitude boosts equipment scaling by a certain percentage, so we get something akin to a 30% stat upgrade, and on top of that we do a cheeky reincarnation, further boosting our base stats, and dumping all our spare points into hit. With that done, let's give this stage another whack. We very slowly creep up, sectioning off the opposing army, dispatching everything in two hits along the way. Two hits isn't one hit, but given that our maids get two items per turn, kinda is. Edging ever so closer, we hit the aggro range of every foe in the stage, and one maid takes well over half her health from the boss. She retaliates with a crit for an insta-kill, allowing her to heal with her second item, and the parallel maid commits two-turn destruction of another foe. It's going pretty well until everyone starts to encroach, and one of my beauties cops an ailment, dropping her stats by half. Throwing an item at the boss, it deals a halved 300 damage. 
He can kill me in a few hits on his own and has 13,000 health, so I split off and try to tank his bullets with my ailed waifu while my healthy harlot focuses on the grunts. Luckily, his focus is singular, allowing my primary gal to slowly whittle down every small fry, then we focus on the boss and trade hits until he drops. Well that's done, and I didn't have to grind to the point of walking through the game. See, this guy can be mentally engaging. During this fight, I also discovered that using healing items bumps the bonus gauge, which is great as I'm running out of Mr. Gensi exits, an item that allows you to exit the item world at any time. This is going to make later grinding much safer. We end the chapter with a red guy expanding his massive, throbbing muscles and punching a spear or some shit. Chapter 10 begins, our protagonist talks to himself some more, as is anime tradition, then we skip the cutscenes and check what items we unlock this time. It's just a nice variant of the fire scroll from the last chapter. Cool. 10-1 is full of zombies, genuinely wall-to-wall, -wall, straight up like 60 enemies. I start getting fuckled upon, then I realise I can send out my low-level weak guys to heal my maids as they mow through the hordes of corpses. This actually works, and I survive with a single character at critical health after expending all of my healing. Hot damn, what a stage! The boys talk more about curry, because the narrative hasn't progressed in 6 chapters, then we head to the next stage to drop more zombies, though slightly faster as we've gained enough stats leveling in the former map to one-shot them. Then we're treated to a flashback about curry, make some zombies into a curry, and get a telegram letting us know that the netherworld is about to be nuked into a curry. Man, this game's making me hungry, I could go for some pizza. Following this, we see the same trick in the same location as a few chapters ago, as a necromancing anime child resurrects the bunny girl's parents. Again. Why have this many stages if all you're gonna do is repeat them endlessly? You know narratives are supposed to progress, and fucking end, right? <laughs> This boss isn't too bad, I played loosely and got pincered on the bridge, copping a fair whack of damage, but pulling back a little saw a passive boss until I took out the rabble, which scored me an easy win. In the following narrative bite, the bunny girl gets death poisoned, and we're on to chapter 11, where she gets instantly cured by the soft boy who comes out as an angel. That's fucking disgusting. Keep that shit to yourself. This may seem stupid, but it allows us to continue on with the plot that definitely exists, as Disgaea isn't brave enough to drop core characters for story reasons. Checking the store, and there's no new items this chapter, so in my despair I plunge into the item world for a bit of cash to upgrade my equipment, then I head on over to speed through chapter 11. Stage 1's generic, stage 2 has us chasing rabbits and getting bombarded with explosives, but they promptly cease once the rabbits are genocided. The third stage focuses on silence, which doesn't affect us, I don't remember the fourth stage, and the final stage is the necromancer girl again, and she's still weak. New chapter! New items! I love it! It's a lightning version of the Fire Scroll. Shocking. The entirety of the 12th chapter is focused on traversing half-destroyed stages, some requiring throwing and building platforms with boxes to step over crumbling walls. But as you're setting up the boxes in the first stage, it's pissing down explosive barrels which destroy them. It would have been a cautious retry had I lost, but I barely overcame the challenge, handing all my foes their medals. 12-3 and 4 don't feature this requirement, and I don't remember 12-2? You should look it up, I bet it's amazing. Upon completing the fourth stage, our intended protagonist has a little hissy fit and goes Super Saiyan, rocketing him to level 100 and requiring him to dispatch all the foes in this bonus map. Despite supposedly being a tough dude, he's got less than half my maid's hit, and I was expecting to have to restart over and over as he likely would have counted everything to death. However, his turn never ends, so our hero screams his iconic catchphrase, Arma kill ya, and then I infinitely select items and wipe the map. Then everything goes back to normal, because we have to make safe progress in the video game, and we couldn't do that without our character. Now we're on to chapter 13, time to check the items. Nothing new, let's keep moving. The game has to end at some point, my god. Chapter 13 is just nothing. The stages have a real comfy vibe to them, but they're full of generic throwaways, and then the black armor guy shows up again, and we beat him for like the... What is it, like the fifth time? If you don't have the narrative content for 15 chapters, you don't have to commit to that many. Just make it like 6 or 7, and focus on the end game. The current story beat is that Killia has an angry boy inside of him, and it's suppressed by eating tons of slop. The more calories he consumes, the easier it's suppressed, and uh, needless to say, that's one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever heard, though it does shine a reflective light on why Curry's such a core element to the story. Anyway, Killia has to participate in this skirmish against Black Armor, but I hold him back and easily clear it with my maids. On to the next chapter, bringing with it a new item, which is potentially huge. Demon's Bullet not only has 130 base hit, but also 130 speed, and a range of 5. Now I don't know how damage formulas break down, but theoretically this should do 20 more base power from hit scaling, a small bonus from the 130 speed scaling, and it can be thrown an extra space farther than the medals. If that's all correct, this is game changing, in the sense that I'm going to beat the game even easier. I immediately pocket 300 of them as my inspiration to continue the run has returned in full. 
I'm unable to afford any gear upgrades, but let's be real, we've faced no challenge thus far, so who cares, I, I got demon bullets. Let's do a quick damage test. It seems like I gained a thousand damage on my weaker girl and lost a thousand on my stronger one. The damage variance makes it too difficult to really tell, but on paper I'm fairly certain I'm doing more damage. I don't know anymore, man. <laughs> Shit. The next chapter is narratively fun, as we end up in the kingdom of the flotation device, who has been with us since the beginning, and it turns out it's, it's not real, it's just a big old piece of cardboard. The battles aren't anything to write home about, and the stage gimmicks are just a repeat of former stages, but that extra range we're getting on these attack items is crazy. However, as I mow through countless hordes of Prinny, my eyes begin to dull, my mind empties, and I think about how nice it'd be to have an item that hits multiple targets. We hit the fourth stage of the chapter, and oh my god, it's actually interesting! How many chapters has it been? Since something fun happened! In the second stage, there are lasers which target your allies, taking one turn to target and the other to fire, allowing you to move well out of range by the time they actually hit. In this stage, all the foes are lifting guys, so they run towards you, lift you, disallowing your action, and then sacrifice themselves to enact mutually assured destruction. Now that is a fun level idea! Then we find the magical spear in the Hall of the King, which is unfortunately another bland stage, though the enemies do have huge defences. Princess Boing Boing has come to terms with being poor, and states that money and possessions won't make her happy, but now I disagree as someone who values items more than he should. A new chapter means a new item, but this one's special, as it's the penultimate chapter. There may never be another item, and it's a shuriken, which is like a demon's bullet but scales to attack instead of hit. One final curry is shared. The question remains, when will the titty monster cement her friendship with Kilia and release the final bullet into his skull? The final stage beats my ass, real hard too, I can no longer one-shot enemies and they hit pretty hard. My strength was always in my damage output, but I never built a character to take hits, so when I'm evenly matched, a couple turns is enough to put me down. I walk away and do some... I'm not gonna say extended grinding, but it really is the only way to beat this guy a fight, so we do that and I come back supercharged. Most of my attacks one-shot foes, but I am a bit bulkier now, having shifted to the max level maid class. The second stage is nothing, but the third stage features another hundred zombies and an actual end to the Necromancer Girl arc, which frankly should have happened ten chapters ago. The sheer volume of damage coming my way takes me down to around half health, but the zombie swarms also mutilate one another, so it's not too bad. I don't even think the boss fired off an attack. These five range items are killer. Next up is Cecil, who's another case of this arc should have ended chapters ago. This fight's also easy, uh, despite the ten or so giant demon guys he brought with him. Next up, the final chapter. The last time I'll say, let's see what item we get. If I get nothing, I'm gonna be pissed. A hand axe, huh? I can't use this. Yet. Oh, well, at least I got something. I gear everyone up for the final time and head to end this dull run. The first stage of the final chapter, and the fucking necromancer's back here. Is, is it that hard to invent a new antagonist? I got a party full of useless characters who I hate. Make one of them evil. We churn through a few more burner stages before we hit the meat. Void Dark, Virgil, the big bad guy who blows up planets and s sits down. He's pretty weak and dies. I need more power. Even the characters mention it was a bad fight because it's a fake out and the real final stage is up next. The real final boss is a girl who fused with Void Dark's evil side, which is odd because I thought he was fully evil. Anyway, we pop four prongs with 25,000 health and the core guy has 200. He deals bugger all damage and receives way more than the last guy, so it's over fairly quickly. And that's it. Just Gaia 5 with items only. It was one of the most bland things I've ever experienced, but it's possible. There was minimal challenge, a decent amount of grinding, and very few times I had to use my brain or learn more about the game. But we're not done yet. All true Gaia fans know that what we just did was the prelude to the real game, because the end is the real beginning. The first DLC's up, and I'm fighting the protagonists from Disgaea 1, Lahal and Etna. I strike them down with appropriate bullets, and they drop like sacks of a thousand-year-old demon shit. Next up is Flon, who isn't any stronger, but comes with a couple more buds. She still goes down fast, but she's not done yet, as she recruits Sicily from Disgaea D2 and transforms into an idol. Though mildly tougher, they're still stupidly easy, and Lahal has a birthday party. I just want to go back to Disgaea 2, Bryce. Just let me go back. We run through another post-game scenario, this time with Prière from La Pucelle, and I quickly realise that these are all DLC scenarios I just unlocked, and not the actual end game. The stuff I'm after was in the base game, so in an attempt to unlock it, I garner a 14% approval rating. In Disgaea, if you fail to pass a bill, you can kill all the Senate members who blocked you, and I for one support this kind of governance. You know, in Disgaea. Fighting the structural power, we clear through them with ease. Believe it or not, politicians are weak cowards. Well, all but one, anyway. With this, we unlock the first of our proper endgame stages, the Asagi Clones. 
Asagi's a bit of a joke character, and I never got it, but we're going to this time by wiping hundreds of clones off the face of Der Earth. This fight's easy, but it's a long one when I can't counter or use skills. Still, after a solid 20 minutes of item chucking, we're golden. One of the toughest challenges in any Disgaea game is Baal, the Tyrant Overlord, so I push ahead to see how much grinding we'll be doing, and I don't even make it out of the base panel. In this iteration, he appears with three other copies of himself, all heckin' equally valid. They have an average of 35 million points in every stat, and 60 in attack, and as you exit the base panel, you're whacked for a whopping 5 million damage. I currently have around 50,000 health and 7,000 in each stat, barring hit, which is around 15,000. See you guys in 300 hours. On our way there, I stop off at the first endgame boss, and it's the... it's the fucking Necromancer again. She's level 300 this time, but her stats are still stupidly low when we roll her. Then we hit up the second stage, and it's the... it's the Necro... they... they did it again. She's level 500 this time, but again has stupidly low stats. Whenever we deal damage, we take 10% of it back, but it's still not enough to drop us. But then she joins our party, despite having killed one of the main character's parents, death poisoning the child, and being wholly antagonistic during every encounter. She's level 500, which is 200 higher than my maids at this point, but still way weaker. I do some more political campaigning regarding the power of items, and end up in a bit of a rut. So I head on into the character world to increase my ability slots, which allows me to equip a technique increasing my item range by two panels. Void Dark becomes our ally after some fairly bland stages, and we're rolling in endgame boons by this point. Our cheat shop has a lot of points to distribute, we're crafting items and assigning people into clubs and shit, but I don't want to explain any of that, just know that we're specking really hard. Acquiring these two characters allows me to unlock the final martial training level, which is an extreme grind map. This is tough at my low level and with my low stats, but I realise that pounding the bonus gauge with healing items will grant me a free Arcadia on completion, and this is one of the best items in the game. I've power ground my girls to well over level 1000, which honestly isn't that hard when you've got access to this stage. I smack through the item world on the Arcadia that I got, powering through to increase its stats as high as they'll go. At this point, I'm dealing north of 200,000 damage, depending on the enemy. I head to the character world to increase my armor mastery, which increases overall stat gains from any armor I have equipped, also maxing out my ability slots while I'm here. Flying through a couple more levels with generic bosses, Mr. Black Armor returns. I knew it was only a matter of time. This is going to be piss easy, nothing has been remotely challenging thus far. I press my maids forward and... Oh. They get one shot by generics. Well, this is the point of no return. It's time to stop showering and hit the item world until my eyes pull with Japan induced crimson rage. I need defense, so I item world some armors while mastering subclasses, as the more classes you master, the more points you're granted on reincarnation. I'm pretty sure I explained reincarnation. W well, look, you start again from level one, and your base stats get a huge increase, so you end up way stronger. After a significant amount of grinding, I stop for a check in and notice my girls have a little gun experience. Weapon experience is granted by using the weapon to attack, but I've never used it to attack, and I don't have any skills either, so items would probably do more damage than a basic hit. Most of my grind time was spent thinking about other videos I want to work on, or watching VTuber feet ASMR, so I can't really say why my maids have gone rogue. The only thing I can think of is that they've been moved to counter panels in the item world without my consent, and that they've returned fire also without my consent. Shortly after writing this, I actually saw it happen with my own two eyes. I'm not going to invalidate this entire run over some poor luck and lack of attention, but I will be hypervigilant from now on. I will also say that it could have been from getting confused, which isn't my fault. Uh, the game is cheating, not me. Another benefit to the character world is that you can share unique abilities through your party, so I take Void Dark through it and make him share his unique ability, Violence. This increases stats by 50% at the cost of 50% of your experience, but as levels aren't a huge deal, I'll take the flat 50% increase, thank you very much. Fast forward 30 hours and I steal a trapezohedron from an item god. This is the ultimate accessory, and it's time to power. I'm starting to gain some real chops, as in addition to the trap, I have a level 100 legendary Hercules armor, which is a decently leveled rank 40 armor, the best in the game. This gives me a shitload to all my stats and some extra movement, it's got nice little benefits. I head back to the Carnage Dimension, I am now level 4200, and I'd like to try my hand at the Black Armor guy again. All my stats are in the hundreds of thousands by now, I've buffed my defense, and it's time to see if I still get one shot. I push up, hit the lifters for half their max health, which is about 500,000. I take a full assault from the boys, but barely lose any health. This is it, gamers, we've shed our normie facade. What's that? You shower once a week. I don't even own a shower. The fodder foes are getting chewed, and the boss takes stupid damage from my maids as well, downing him in four items. The next stage, Overture of Downfall, a very Japanese name, has a carnage demon as the boss. And a pretty... 
and a dragon and a bear and two other guys. There's a few bosses and their stats are comparable to our maids. Let's see what we can do. The maids are off, almost killing the dragon with four items and finishing him on the start of the second turn. They assault the level 2000 Prinny Overlord and do 100,000 damage, a chip off his 10 million health. I'm discouraged, but I keep at it. Nobody ever pulled off stupid miracles by doing math in their head. The Prinny's up and he shreds them both in a single turn. Oh well, no point moping, it's uh, time to get serious. I reincarnate my maids, their base stats are absolutely through the roof at this point, but we need a bit more of a boost. Here is where I'll introduce squads, which are groups you can assign your characters to, giving you even more stats and power-ups. I slap my now level 1 girls in the Elite 4 squad, which reduces experience earned to a quarter, but increases the growth rate by 60% in its upgraded form. I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I don't know what growth rate does, but it sounds good, so let's roll. I quickly regrind to 1500, and wouldn't you know it, I'm significantly stronger than I was at level 4000. God, I love this guy. Apparently, I also ground my Hercules armor to level 230, which would explain how I gained another 1000 levels between recordings. Well, with over 2 million health, 400,000 defense, and 500,000 hit, I think I'm a viable contender for that penguin bastard. I rock in, blast the dragon away in the first turn. In the second, I Creamer deals devastating damage to a demon, and Iteema hits the Prinny for a solid chunk. Let's see if we can survive what they've got to dish out. Damn, we barely got hit. It must suck to be playing a game against a no-life king. From here again, it's just a war of attrition, and we're about to win as the Prinny explodes and wipes us all. Due to how this Gaia works, I still have eight potential characters I can bring out in my base panel, so we win, but he took his ball and fucked right off the earth. With that complete, I can follow him to the depths of the Carnage world, which is the regular world, but with more Carnage. It turns out this is a justification to make me play the entire game again. Even the low rank items in Carnage form have higher base stats than most of my extremely leveled rank 40 items, so I'm being politely asked to do everything again, but in red. The sunken cost fallacy is stupid. If I keep going, I know I will win. I, I have nothing better to do. I blow through a few levels, but quickly find that I've plateaued in both character and endgame progression. I lack the stats to grab the high rank equipment, which will give me the stats to grab the high rank equipment, so I'm kind of stuck in a cycle of getting nowhere and it shows. I power level to hit the cap a few times, then reincarnate to get my base stats as high as possible, and this is all done in the item world, since I still can't take the guys in the carnage grind maps. I will say though, I did use Rotten Garbage, that real early item that poisons dudes to pass one of the ordeal stages, so that's neat, if a little cheesy. After another long while, I end up with all the endgame shit, the carnage trap, a real good carnage gun, and probably some other stuff, but before I power level that shit, let's see if I'm Baal ready. I'm gonna put my Baals on the table. <laughs> Isn't it pronounced Bale? Bale! I'm not gonna swap, I've come too far. I enter the stage, he fires off not one, but four lasers, hitting me for 5 million health apiece. Immediately, my 40 million health drops to half, but I'm alive, this is progress. I creep up to a bar. I sit in the wrong spot and cancel my move, which puts me back in the base panel. With 17 million health, I leave the base panel again and get hit for another 20. Let's just say, mistakes were made. I have another try, and with my 13 million hit stat, I fire off an item at his lackey and do zero damage. By this point, I've only been focusing on Itima and have left everyone else in the dust, so that's game. Okay, time to push a little harder. I max all my subclasses and at level 9999 I have 15 million in each stat and about 80 million health. As I'm moving through the item world, amassing levels and decent equipment, I've come to the realization that it's time for a shift in approach. Sure, I'm doing pretty well considering my circumstances, but the lack of any item progress since chapter 10 I feel has hindered me. I've also become aware of a DLC class, Zokunoichi, who has an ability that allows you to throw weapons as usable items and it scales to the attack stat. This would give me infinite access to attack items with a base damage 10 times higher than what I have now, in the thousands versus the hundreds. I'm gonna get some good items, hit the maximum level, then reincarnate and wait everything to attack, just to see if the damage output is worth the huge mix-up to my characters. What I also didn't realize was that there's two attack-based items you can generate in the Alchemy Lab, Rocket Punch and Claymore Lance. Claymore Lance does about the same damage as Hand Axes, the best attack items you can buy from the store, with Hand Axes having 140 and Claymores having... Well, anywhere from 150 to 180. However, they're an area of effect attack, which I brutally discovered while accidentally using one. This is a game changer for the item world, and would have been a game changer like a hundred chapters ago had I known. The Rocket Punch has anywhere from 240 to 270 damage, which is around double the Hand Axe. With an ability that increases my damage based on how far I am from the opponent, I do little tests, and with all the maximum range, a Rocket Punch pulled out an impressive 190 million damage. The Claymore Lance did a whopping 120, and the Hand Axe was anywhere from 100 to 120, plus a defense debuff. 
Testing the aforementioned Kanoichi's weapon throw ability, the best attack weapons in the store only dealt about the same as a hand axe, so we'll scrap that idea. Well I guess I'm farming rocket punches, they have one more range so they get an extra 15% damage on top, plus I can get them for free from the alchemy boy. I also equip an ability called Winning Lottery, which gives me a 30% chance to receive a free copy of an expendable as I use it, which means if I'm lucky I'll have to farm 30% less rocket punches. I was a couple levels deep in my Baal sword, the best sword in the game, and got charmed into leveling my sword proficiency, which sucked. I have level 1 proficiency now, and if you see that in the stat screen, that's why. So you can make your own curry, which grants various benefits. If you make it with 100 thimbles, the weakest fist weapon, it gives your entire party a guaranteed crit rate. These only last as long as you let them sit, so I let it sit for a maximum period of 100 battles as I'm item welding. I come and collect my max crit rate, slap another 100 gloves in the pot, and away we go, I just doubled my damage permanently. Disgaea 5 has special sub-worlds within the item world, which allow you to dupe equipment, so I duped a Hercules armor at level 500 and maxed out my other one. I'm feeling pretty good as I pass 40 million defense, so I head to the character world to start increasing my stat aptitudes, and I mean if you've been paying attention you should know what that is by now. After all of this, I try Baal again, and examining this battle a little more in depth shows me that I can't win. But that's right, this stat stomping attempt, while I'm sure it was impressive, was for absolutely nothing. Here's how the Baal fight is set up. We have four big vinegary Baals in either direction from the center point dispatch zone. Each overlord has two little chums and a bit friend who is immune from damage until the Baal goes down. There are also two stray demons off to the side who have passives that tank your stats and boost their own. Not only can this Baal easily one-shot me despite how high my stats are, which is around 50% of the way to the absolute cap, I can still only attack twice per turn. At absolute best, I would need two turns to clear the generics as I can now take them in a single shot with lucky rolls. The issue is that I can't survive a single turn because of how hard these dudes hit, and I can't use magic change, overlord abilities, or executable skills and buffs. All I can use is two items per turn. If I were to theoretically create four of my item use chick, I'd still lose as each bit has an ability that guarantees death upon defeat. So I'd have to make at least five of them, assuming any of those could even survive long enough to kill the Baals and the generics. I'd likely need a full squad of my main character, who it took around 50 hours to grind up, and I'm not even done, I could make her stronger. She has 250% in her main aptitudes, and those could be pushed to 300. Some weapons are also in the 200s to 300s level wise, so I've got a few hundred more levels worth of stats, and I could rank them up to epic rarity for like 15-20% to 20 on top of that. With set bonuses, if you have all epic gear equipped, I'd get like 30% more on top of all that, so I reckon I could have my stats go from 30 to 40 million to like 50 to 60 maybe, but even then, it's not enough. There's a squad I can't unlock as it requires me to use the skill Squad Attack. This would boost the stats of any of my squad mates by a further 20%. I actually tested this for funsies in an alternate save, and I met my stat increase percentage cap, but it would allow me to remove one ability, potentially allowing for more damage output or better defenses. Still, I don't think anything's going to keep me alive against Baal. Another group unlocks after you use the giant form three times, which I perform in the mushroom stage, as I can throw giant mushrooms at my dudes instead of manually triggering the overlord ability. This unlocks the giant squad, allowing me to gain the form at the start of a fight. The giant status gives stat boost to everything and seems to double my health, and even with that I'm killed in one turn in the Baal stage. 50 million defense, 400 million health, and I can't survive a single turn. There are two stages stronger than this as well, with there being a Carnage version of the final boss who has a similar though smaller setup to Baal, and Carnage Baal, which I don't even want to imagine. I power level a little more and give the Baals one final try. I can one-shot everyone on the map but the bits, and given my movement range and ability that allows me to move again after using an item, I can one-shot one Baal and head to the other side of the map to clean up another. Effectively, it is doable at this point, but I need about eight versions of this one chick I worked for like a hundred hours on. This would involve making six more girls, grinding and reincarnating them almost infinitely, then running through the item world of my four primary weapons and duping them eight times each. This would add at least another 100 hours, if I were lucky, and I'm just not down for that. I know when it's time to bow out. I feel like I've achieved a lot using items only, and discovered some really cool shit about a game I initially disliked. I still kinda dislike it because I didn't beat Baal, but I guess that's my fault. And also the story is complete dog shit. So yes, you can beat Disgaea 5 with items only, and I'm gonna say that the endgame is possible too, but... Man, I need a shower.